Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Chris Bockelman. I'm chair of the board of the Highlands Current, and I want to welcome you to this um, special benefit for our members, um, a conversation with uh, Margaret Sullivan and, and then with um, our community um, to ask uh, any questions you may have of our editor and, uh, and uh, senior editor and beacon editor. Um, Margaret is Washington Post media columnist, and we very much appreciate you joining us today. Um, she's also author of the book uh, published last year, Ghosting the News, Local Journalism and the Crisis of American Democracy. And there we go. Thanks, Chip. Thank uh, that's, that's Chip Rowe, our editor, for those who uh, don't know, but I think everyone on here does. And uh, I'll turn it over to you now, Chip, to um, interview Margaret. Thank you again, Margaret, for joining Thanks us. Thanks very much, Chris. Okay. Thanks, Chris. So as uh, Chris mentioned, Margaret Sullivan is the media columnist at the Washington Post, uh, formerly the public editor at the New York Times, which was a slightly different job, which I can ask her about. Uh, she also, uh, for New Yorkers here, uh, was uh, the, the chief editor of the Buffalo News, which is uh, in her hometown. And as Chris mentioned, she's the author of, it's always hard to get it in, the, there we go, Ghosting the News, uh, which is a wonderful book. Uh, it's about the relationship of local journalism and democracy, uh, essentially, which we'll talk about as well. Um, and I thought, you know, she also is a graduate of Georgetown and uh, Northwestern University's Medill School of Journalism. We have that in common um, and has taught uh, at Columbia City University of New York. And I thought I'd just run down. So, so her column is different. So when, when you, the, at the ombudsman at the New York Times would, would receive basically complaints from readers and then sort them out and investigate them and research and write about them. The media columnist is more covering the media. And if you look at like her last few columns, she wrote about the effort to revive Rolling Stone magazine. She wrote about a Reuters investigation into the One American News Channel. Uh, she presented a solution to rein in Facebook. Uh, she talked about why some journalists, when they described the audit or the second or the third audit, whatever audit it was in Arizona, wouldn't call in an audit uh, because it wasn't official, it wasn't uh, following protocols. And also a topic that I'd like to ask you about is this effort in Congress to create a, a system where people would get tax credits uh, for supporting their local news outlets. So I guess first, Margaret, you know, when we talk about ghosting the news, um, what does that mean and what was really, why did you write the book? I mean, what's, what's the purpose of the book to get it out there? So um, thank you very much for the introduction and thanks um, for having me. And it's really nice to, it's really nice to be here. Um, I made my first trip to Beacon oh, that's my, right. that's my nice. life last, last weekend because I took the train to Beacon with a friend and we then went to Storm King and it was really fun. Um, and Beacon seems like a great town and the area seems really interesting. I'd, I'd certainly like to come back. I haven't spent time there before. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. I feel like I have a connection now. Um, the reason I wrote the book is that I had spent most of my career as an editor, reporter and editor in local news at um, the Buffalo News, which is the biggest uh, news organization in New York State outside of the direct New York City area. So once you get outside, you know, Metro New York, it's it's the largest news organization. And when I became editor there, there were 200 people in the newsroom, good hefty size newsroom. And then I was editor for a dozen years. And by the time I left, we had had to downsize to about 140. And now, and it's not that much later, I left in 2012, they're down to probably 75 people in the newsroom. So it's been a really precipitous decline. And when you lose that much staff, you cannot actually cover things the way you used to. I mean, one of the, I live uh, at a cottage in the Buffalo area in the summer for part of the summer. And I always get the print Buffalo news, right? You know, my paper that I grew up at basically. And when I see it, I, I learn a lot from it. I get a lot out of it, but I also realize it's, 
it's becoming um, much less robust than it was. I started a section when I was the features editor called Life and Arts um, that had all the culture coverage in it and feature writing and like great writers. And I was really proud of it. It was kind of modeled on the style section of the Washington Post. And that section just no longer exists. You know, so all that culture coverage, I'm not saying they don't do any culture coverage, but a lot of it is gone. So ghosting the news means, you know, kind of abandoning uh, the news, which is, although news organizations and reporters and editors don't mean to be abandoning the news, the business model these days is such that there's much less revenue and there's much less healthy environment for newspapers and a lot of other local news organizations. So in effect, they have, if not abandoned, they're sort of moving away from full coverage. So that's what it's about. And the reason I wrote it was because a lot of people don't realize this. There was some research from the Pew Research Institute a few years ago that's, that showed that, you know, regular citizens, American citizens thought that newspapers were doing great. They're profitable, they're doing well, we don't like them necessarily, but uh, but but they're financially viable. And that is, for the most part, not the case. So I thought it was really important to explain to people that that's not the case and to sound an alarm so that these really valuable institutions can, you know, get some attention and hopefully get some um, some the kind of attention that could actually help them uh, thrive or at least stay in business. And also, I should mention, you know, there are places all over the country where there actually is no news. There's there's no news organizations. And those are called news deserts. And there's an increasing number of them. Um, 2,000 papers have gone out of business between 2004 and 2019. And then, of course, when the pandemic hit, papers took another hit. Um, so it's a bad, it's a very bad situation. And that's why I wrote the book to try to draw some attention to it. You mentioned, uh, you know, in passing that this kind of, you referenced the love hate relationship that people <laughs> yes. sometimes have um, with a local paper. I mean, what does it mean to be a good paper when people say we have a good paper? Um, do they really, I'm a little cynical, I guess, but do they really want a good paper? What does that mean to people? It's kind of different what they say and what we would might consider as journalists to be a good. Right. Well, you know, new, newspapers and journalists do tend to annoy people and that's part of sort of why they exist. And so you can't make everybody happy all the time, nor should you be trying to. But I think a good paper is one that holds public officials accountable that attends local meetings and is the eyes and ears of the public and that tells the truth um, to the extent possible and seeks the truth, not just tells it, but actually seeks it, whether it's through freedom of information uh, requests or, you know, pounding on doors or whatever it may be to, you know, actively seek out what's happening in their communities and report it fairly and accurately. And you know what? We don't do a perfect job of that. And sometimes we make big mistakes. And I can tell you that I have made big mistakes in my career. And um, I'm just happy that I've survived some of them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think every journalist, it, you know, the typos are hard enough. But um, you, you hey, the bigger try. stuff is worse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I wonder about the connection. You know, these places lose newspapers. But there's so much information on Facebook, people, you know, just information out there. I mean, I feel like sometimes we're chasing Facebook. We get news tips off Facebook. People, you know, discuss things on Facebook without a thought to send it to us, right? right. Or the newspaper. I mean, is some of that being picked up? Is that good or bad? You talked in your column about mm -hmm. reining in, kind of reining in Facebook. Um, right. Well, I mean, you know, Facebook can serve a purpose. It can, as they will, as Mark Zuckerberg will tell you night and day, it's there to connect people. Um, and it does do that, but it also does a lot of other things that aren't so good, like spread misinformation and play to people's worst instincts. But yeah, there's no question that news will sometimes surface on Facebook and it can be sort of a tip service in some ways. 
Um, it's also a way to, you know, it can, I've found it a way to do research at times. I, I'm actually writing another book and I'm trying to, I was trying to look back at the town I grew up in, Lackawanna, which had a big steel mill. And as kids, we would see this glorious red sky at night, you know, and, but it wasn't a sunset. It was, we knew it as they're dumping the slag. Well, I wanted to find out what that really meant. So I tried to look it up in the usual ways and I wasn't getting a good answer. So I put it out on Facebook because I have a lot of friends from Buffalo and Lackawanna and Pittsburgh and other steel towns. What does it mean when they say dumping the slag? And I got just a ton of information. Um, and of course, I couldn't take it at face value. I had to check it out. But it was actually extremely helpful to be able to, I guess, you could say crowdsource some of these things. Social right. media does serve a purpose and it also does harm. So it's a double edged sword. Um, do you think it affects how people view local papers, though, that maybe they're not as ne uh, necessary? I mean, I don't need this. I mean, we come up, this comes up maybe with younger people, like why are, how do we get them to read the current? You know, how do we get them to pick up the paper? And even my own kids are like, well, I get everything I need. It's all free. It's like, I just pull it up on my phone, Dad. Right. Why should I get this, this, this printed thing? Yeah. Uh, so well, I, think, I mean, I, I do think that uh, the idea of getting young people, a couple generations of young people now to read the printed newspaper is a really heavy lift. Um, it's just not the way they relate to the news. But that, you know, as you know very well, that's not the only way that newspapers get news out. And we do have an online presence and we do use social and all of that sort of thing. So um, I think that the way to get the, get it across is that we have, we have some like, I mean, I wouldn't use the word curating, but that is what we're doing. We're trying to actually present things with some sense of priority, with fact checking, with reporting, not just like rumor or, hey, I heard this or here's a crazy video. You know, it actually tries to get to the closest approximation of the truth that we can. And that's worth supporting. And, you know, maybe this would be one of your questions, but I'll jump the gun by saying that when local news goes away, some really bad stuff happens in communities. So some of the really bad things that happen, which speaks to the subtitle of my book, The Crisis of American Democracy, is that people become much more polarized in their views. And we've got enough of that going on right now, so we don't really need to make it worse. But when local newspapers go away, people become more polarized. They vote more strictly according to party line, not ever, you know, sort of crossing the line. Um, they're much less civically engaged. You know, they don't join community organizations as much and all of that sort of thing. And municipal costs go up. Why do municipal costs go up? Because there's no one watching the store. And so, you know, I mean, we'd like to think that politicians will, you know, be honest and do their job, but they'll be more honest and do their job better if there's somebody in the room watching them. Um, so I think those are all some of the things that, you know, but it's a hard, it's a hard argument to make. It's a hard argument to make to people who have found that they think they don't need it. What they don't know sometimes is that some of the news they're actually getting is coming from the newspaper or coming from the public TV station or radio station or whatever it may be. That's where it's that's where it's been generated. And um, and so then it's being like sort of spread. Yeah, it's oh, I get it. It's on my phone. Well, it doesn't happen by fairies. You know, it, it actually requires reporters and editors and fact checking and corrections and all those kinds of things. You've, um, I know you travel a lot to speak about this. I mean, I, I saw you, I think, it, well, it seems like everything's, I can't remember how many years ago because of the pandemic. <laughs> yeah, when, when, we're all speaking, uh, when did you speak at the New York Press Association? Was that? <laughs> it was a while ago. 2019. Um, so I know you go around to talk to a lot of people about the local news and, and you know, what do you hear? Out, we're obviously, obviously in a little town here, but are you hearing the same things across the country when you talk to people about their views of local news? I mean, do they complain? Yeah, they I mean, you know, I think people are starting to understand that. I mean, one of the big things that's happened is that these hedge funds are buying up newspapers 
and it's a terrible thing. So there's one of them, the worst of them, I think, is called Alden Global. It's basically a private equity company, a hedge fund that's buying up these papers. And I mean, big storied, legendary papers like the Chicago Tribune, the Baltimore Sun, the Hartford Current, on and on, uh, the New York Daily News. And they're sort of wringing the last profits out of them by firing or getting rid of a lot of their staff and just sort of taking, you know, it's like people call them vulture capitals, capitalists, because they're, they're sort of circling the carcass that they've helped create. And so there's been enough publicity about that, that I think people are starting to understand that. I mean, the Chicago Tribune just fell into the hands of this, of this hedge fund. And it's, to me, it's tragic. I mean, you went to Northwestern too, and you know, the Trib was like this glorious thing that you looked up to. And it's, it's no longer that. So, you know, but I talk to people a lot about their news habits, like how do they get their news and mm -hmm. what do they value? And, you know, I do find that the people who seem most well informed are reading a newspaper. <laughs> Maybe they're not reading it in print, but they are reading a newspaper. I mean, one summer, a couple years ago, I just... I, again, I was in Western New York in a red district. Um, it, it's the most Republican district in New York State. And I went around and talked to people about their their politics and their news habits. And, you know, I, I can honestly tell you that the people who read a newspaper had a much more like sort of balanced view and a much less sort of inflamed view of national politics and local politics. And they kind of knew a little bit more of what was going on. Like the sheriff's race in your community, right? That's an interesting story. Sure. Um, do, so, so people, did they complain about the same, I mean, I guess, or did they praise or complain about their local specifically small papers or? Yeah, they complain. It's, like it's the same yes. everywhere. I mean, they do complain that, you know, they'll tend to compare the paper now with some sort of hazy idea of what it used to be like once upon a time. But, you know, I take that with a grain of salt because I'm not sure that that, that might be a little bit of hindsight not being quite right. But, you know, yes, people get annoyed by the paper. And when we get things wrong, like if you're ever the subject of a news story, and I have been too, it is amazing the number of things that are just like not quite right in there, you know? And that's it, when people get small things wrong, it makes you think, wow, well, maybe the whole thing is wrong. So I think getting the details right is super, super important. And also correcting it when we get it wrong is another way to, you know, enhance our credibility. But sure, right. I, do, I do hear complaints and I also hear appreciation. Yeah, I think that's the reason that um, reporters cringe. It's the worst feeling that you spelled someone's name wrong. Absolutely. Not only because it's, you know that they're going to be upset and you were sloppy. Exactly. You it, but exactly. then you cast doubt on everything in the story. Exactly. Um, and it's, I think it's one of the things that journalists have a hard time doing, maybe when you're younger, but is although I've gotten more comfortable with it, is correcting it. It's like yeah. admitting like. Exactly. No. Um, right, you just, you just don't want it to be too much. I mean, too many yeah, times. Yeah. Once in a while, it's not too bad, but you know. Yeah, but it happens. Um, right, I think, I think admitting error is an important part of that transparency that gives us some element of trust. Yeah. So what, one thing, you know, we're a nonprofit. Um, I should say if Alden is anyone from Alden is out there, we do entertain offers, but not that we would sell to you, but we would <laughs> listen. Um, what uh, what happens in the future? Like who's going to fund these papers? I think the mid-level papers, it's interesting. The Times, the Post, they're doing OK. Digital. Yes, they're you doing got, well. It was like Buffalo, Milwaukee, you know, kind of the mid level, those yep. seem to be really getting hurt. Whereas the small papers like us, 
where you can kind of directly speak to the people who are reading you. They support it. We do. We have a tons of lots of great members who support us. And but is that the model going forward for, to prevent another two thousand papers from dying? Or is it a billionaire? Do we need all, you know, can we all yeah, have a billionaire? You know, I, I can tell you, I'm, I feel very well versed on the subject of working for billionaires because I've worked for two in Buffalo, Warren Buffett owns right, the Buffalo right. News, and now Jeff Bezos owns the Washington Post. And something I've observed about billionaires is that no matter how much money they have, they actually do not want to operate anything at a loss. And Buffett always said, you know, you don't have to make a lot of money, but you have to make a dollar. He did not want to sustain, um, you know, just, you know, he had the shareholders to think about and he he did not want to sustain long term losses. And, you know, he took a really hard look at the industry um, and he sold all his papers to Lee Enterprises a few years ago. So, you know, the answers are are tough to come by. It's a the problem is you can't say, oh, here's the answer. It's this. It's a combination of things. It's it's asking for support from readers and asking them to subscribe or join, be members. It's sometimes it's philanthropy for nonprofits. Uh, it you know, there are some efforts in Congress to try to give people tax credits or even give small businesses or businesses um, incentives to advertise in local papers. It's kind of a patchwork quilt that you know, could help shore this up. And then, you know, newer efforts are coming up all over the place, nonprofits, you know, digital first places that are making it for better, or for worse, like the Texas Tribune, um, which has a huge event every year and they make a couple million dollars from it, you know, so that's how they sustain themselves. It's, it's a lot of different things, but what it isn't, what it isn't is the old thing which is three, you know, two thirds of your revenue coming from print advertising and a third coming from people subscribing and lots and lots of print advertising because there was no Craigslist, there was no Facebook, there was no Google. And so, and there, you know, direct mail maybe hadn't happened as much. They're just, if you wanted to advertise, you did it in the paper. And so Buffett actually called uh, having a single, a monopoly newspaper in a town, in a city, he said it was like owning a, an unregulated toll bridge because you could basically raise rates Yeah. because people had to pay it. Well, that has changed. There's a lot, lot, everything about that has changed. Well, it's interesting that he was shooting. I mean, if you look at it as a public utility, uh, Buffett trying to get a 1% profit out of it, is great. I mean, back in the day, they were getting 20%, 25% oh, profit. 30%. There seemed to be no plan. Like, what if this goes away? What will we do? I know. So now you've got Alden in there saying, we're going to sell all the buildings. Why do we need this building? You know, we're going to, like you said, we're going to squeeze all the profits out of the real estate, and then we're just going to keep it kind of going along. And and but we want the 20 percent profit. they're not doing it to make one percent so oh absolutely not and you know no. the sort of sad thing about alden or whoever these other um private equity companies are that are buying these papers it's not like they're buying papers that are in the red they're buying papers that are profitable that's why they're buying them but sure. then they're not they're not running them in order to sustain the, the news and to sustain the profit, they're running them to sort of suck them dry and leave them by the side of the road. You can tell, I think it's really great. <laughs> <laughs> well, you mentioned uh, the, um, the legislation, the local journalism sustainability act. I'm a little, you, you, I think support it uh, from based on what you've yep. written. I'm a little more skeptical of it. Um, only because I feel like, Newspapers shouldn't have any ties to the government they cover. And you also see a lot of these small papers that haven't died, have done, have survived only because of legal ads. They are being yeah. paid by the county, the state, paying them to keep it going. And so you do always kind of wonder, well, if you cover them critically, that could be right. off, you know. Um, Sorry. Is that Jeff? Jeff calling? Didn't like that. Yeah, Jeff. He, he doesn't want me to say anything bad about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The, so, 
tell, talk, talk, talk to me about why you think this is a decent idea. Well, I mean, it's, it's a three part thing. It gives a tax, it gives three kinds of tax credits. It gives a tax credit to news consumers, regular people who are going to subscribe to or donate to a local news organization. It gives a tax credit to news organizations for every local reporter they have on staff. And it gives uh, an incentive. I don't know if I think it's a tax credit. It gives some sort of incentive to businesses if they advertise in local newspapers or news organizations. So it kind of comes at it from a bunch of different ways. And I don't think that it is the kind of thing that it, it's not set up so that, you know, Congressman X, Chris Collins, let's say, uh, can say, you know what, I don't like the Buffalo News because they're writing critical things about my insider trading. So I'm going to take away. It, it's, it's not set up that way. It's set up so that it's across the board. You either qualify as a news organization or you don't. And a particular politician, whether it's the president or a congressman or whoever it is, county executive, can't come along and undo that. So I think it has some guardrails built into it. But can't you make it, couldn't you just make it, I know there's another bill uh, that's been introduced to make it easier for newspapers to go nonprofit. It would become a classification as opposed yeah. to you have to be an educational, you know, right. claim. And and newspaper and advertisers already can write off their advertising. It's a business expense. Yeah. So what's the incentive going to be to make it like, oh, you can write it off now if you go to a local paper? They can already do that. So that was the two. Well, I do think that I mean, I, I again, I have to say that I think you have to approach this in different ways. Not every news organization will want to go nonprofit. I can assure you that the Alden papers will not be going nonprofit at any point. Um, you know, there's another effort to give publishers like newspapers the ability to kind of get together um, and bypass this antitrust um, legislation so that they can bargain against Facebook and Google to try to sort of even the playing field. So there's like three or four different things out there. None of them have come to pass yet. And meanwhile, you know, newspapers are going out of business. So I think um, there ought to be a sense of urgency about it. But, you yeah, know, in terms of in terms of like the maybe the people, your members out there who are who are listening and, you know, want to know maybe, OK, you know, what can I do? Not necessarily to sustain local journalism, to to make it suit my needs better. And I would say to care about it, you know, to to be engaged um, in whatever way they can with this news product that they're getting. And that could mean, you know. Um, writing letters. It could mean supporting, like telling their congressman that they care about the Local Journalism Sustainability Act. It, it's like actively being engaged in the value of local news. Yeah, I, th I think we have very engaged readers and, and members, for sure. Um, it's interesting when we talk about small papers. Have you seen the, have you seen Storm Lake or the, yes, the documentary? Yes, I saw it. Yep. So I watched that and I just thought we, we, it, you have to resist kind of making broad statements about small papers because in New York State, for instance, or even where we are, 50 miles north of New York City, you know, there's a, there's a number of weekly papers. We have the Gannett papers. We have, but you go into the Midwest, you go, typically the papers are owned by a family or a couple that's owned it for 40 years and they're because you see them being sold all the time, you know, ten thousand, twenty thousand dollars in these little communities. It's, it's so they are to me seem much more on the brink. Where one bad year or two might, you know, fold it because they're that's their one job, kind of their one livelihood. Whereas the there are a lot of medium sized papers that maybe could survive a little longer. But yeah. You wonder if the 2,000 papers who died, you know, what percentage of those are one man operation, one person operations? Right. A lot right. of them were, I can tell you for sure that the vast majority of them were weeklies, but yeah. there, were, yeah. there were some dailies. Um, you did promise me a half an hour, but I, I see a question. Maybe oh, I was going to just go together. Yeah. Yeah. So I you was, can read it. Can you just, you can see it there. I can see the question about um, cultivating young readers. Yes, that's a good yeah. question. Yeah, so why don't I answer that and maybe 
You okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that the most important way to cultivate young readers is not to treat them as some sort of bizarre subset of people who need like a special section for their cool, weird interests or something. I think it's to treat them as the, as the, you know, as the sort of citizens that they are. And I think most importantly, to come to them where they are. Okay, where are they? Well, they're on their phones, right? And so how are we reaching people in that way? Do we have a good social media team? Are we doing good headlines? Are we uh, updating the website, um, you know, on a really regular and good basis? Or are we stuck in our old ways where we were able to say, no, this is how we do it and you need to come to us. I think it has to be more, much more of a two-way street. Having said that, when I was the editor of the Buffalo News, we, we had a section called Next. And Next was a section that was written by and for teens. Mm -hmm. And it was super cool. And some of the best journalists out there, including at least one of my colleagues at the Washington Post, who is a great writer and a great reporter, Dan Zak, came up through Next. And I was with a, a former Buffalo News intern who's at CBS News now, and we were talking about Next. Well, unfortunately, Next was one of the victims of the cost cutting. And so that's another thing I'm sorry to say. My heart breaks all the time with this stuff. And that was another thing that broke my heart because I know how good it was. And it's so against the best interests of the, the future of the paper to get rid of the very things that are going to, like the culture coverage that was in this life and art section. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's hard. Yeah, I mean, we start. We found that we thought about where, how are we going to reach younger readers, and not because we're all old, <laughs> we don't know what they're talking about, or that. So we started a student journalism program, uh, where we have students from the two high schools we cover are reporters. They're not interns; they're reporters. Yeah. They cover their high schools and oh, news that's issues. That's their beat. So. They're not sitting next to the reporters at a village council meeting, learning how to cover politics. They're out there thinking up story ideas about that age group. And it went really well. We just started it last year. We've got five students this year. Mm. And um, it's been great. They talk to us, they pitch us on ideas. We guide them who they should talk to. And you know they rewrite and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite. And uh, we've gotten a lot of support from members to pay them because we thought it was important that they, you know, be, have it as a job as opposed to an assignment. They're expected to meet a deadline and then they right. get paid. So, right. so um, anyway, I really should. Um, I really course. should. Wrap it up. So, but thank you well, for the opportunity. Thank and, you very uh, much. I appreciate it. The name of the book, I should say again, is Ghosting the News Local Journalism and the Crisis of American Democracy, available everywhere. And it's a good, quick read. Thank um, you. Lays out the case very well. Okay. Thank you, Margaret. Great. Thanks it. a lot. Keep up the good okay. work. Right, so thanks. long. Bye.